It was Halloween night in New York City and I was beyond excited for the massive party happening in Central Park. I'd been planning my costume for weeks. A steampunk-inspired mad scientist with goggles, a fancy top hat, and a lab coat covered in gears and gadgets. My friends and I had been looking forward to this event for months, and we were determined to make it a night to remember. We arrived at the park around 7 p.m., just as the sun was setting and the party was starting to pick up. The atmosphere was electric. The trees were decked out with eerie decorations, fake cobwebs stretched between branches, and jack-o'-lanterns lined the paths, their flickering lights casting spooky shadows. The air was crisp with that perfect autumn chill, and the scent of pumpkin spice and caramel apples wafted from nearby food stands. As we made our way deeper into the park, we were surrounded by a sea of incredible costumes. There were zombies stumbling around, superheroes posing for photos, and mythical creatures dancing to the pulsing music. I saw a group of friends dressed as the entire cast of Stranger Things, complete with Christmas lights and waffles. Another person had an amazingly detailed Groot costume that must have taken months to create. We found a spot near one of the main stages where a popular local band was playing. The music was a mix of Halloween classics and current hits, all with a spooky twist. We danced for what felt like hours, laughing and singing along to Thriller and Monster Mash. The energy was contagious, and it seemed like everyone around us was having the time of their lives. As the night went on, we decided to explore more of the park. We wandered past the Bethesda Fountain which had been transformed into a witch's cauldron, bubbling with dry ice and glowing an eerie green. Near the Belvedere Castle, there was a haunted maze set up, with actors dressed as various monsters jumping out to scare people. We braved the maze, screaming and laughing as we made our way through. It was around 10 p.m. when things took an unexpected turn. We were near the Great Lawn, where a DJ was spinning some intense electronic music. The crowd was thick, with everyone packed together, dancing and enjoying the beats. I was bouncing along to the music when I noticed something odd out of the corner of my eye. A small figure was weaving through the crowd, looking lost and scared. At first I thought it might be part of the Halloween act, maybe a creepy doll costume or something. But as the figure got closer, I realized it was a young boy, probably no more than six or seven years old. He was dressed as a pirate, but his costume was disheveled, his face tear-stained and frightened. I nudged my friend Sarah and pointed out the boy. We exchanged worried glances and decided to approach him. As we got closer, we could see he was trembling and looking around frantically. We tried to get his attention, waving and calling out to him, but he seemed too scared to respond. Finally, we managed to reach him. I crouched down to his level, trying to appear as non-threatening as possible in my mad scientist getup. I asked him where his parents were, but he just shook his head and started crying harder. Sarah tried to comfort him while I looked around, hoping to spot any adults who might be searching for a lost child. We asked the boy for his name, but he was too upset to speak. People around us started to notice the commotion, and a small crowd gathered. Someone suggested we take him to the nearest police officer or security guard. It seemed like the best idea, so we started to make our way out of the crowd, with me holding the boy's hand and Sarah clearing a path. As we walked, I tried to keep the boy calm by pointing out cool costumes and decorations. He seemed to relax a little, his grip on my hand loosening slightly. We passed by a group of people dressed as the Avengers, and I saw a hint of a smile on his face when he saw Captain America. We were almost at the edge of the Great Lawn when suddenly the boy tensed up. His eyes went wide with fear and he started pulling on my hand, trying to hide behind me. I followed his gaze and saw a man in the crowd dressed in a plain black hoodie and jeans. No costume. 
The man was staring right at us with an intensity that made my skin crawl. The boy started screaming, pointing at the man and yelling that it was him. The crowd around us fell silent for a moment, everyone turning to look. The man in the hoodie realized he'd been spotted and took off running. Without thinking, I shouted for someone to stop him and started to give chase. Sarah stayed with the boy as I pushed through the crowd, trying to keep the hooded man in sight. A few other partygoers joined in the chase, but the man was fast and knew how to weave through the packed park. We ran past the sheep meadow, dodging people and Halloween decorations. The chase led us towards the reservoir, with the man always just out of reach. My lungs were burning, and my mad scientist costume was definitely not made for running. As we neared the water, the man suddenly veered off the path and into a dense cluster of trees. By the time we reached the spot, he had vanished. Panting and frustrated, I looked around, trying to spot any sign of him. But it was too dark and there were too many people around in dark costumes. He could have easily blended into the crowd or changed his appearance quickly. After a few minutes of fruitless searching, I realized we had lost him. Dejected, I made my way back to where I had left Sarah and the boy. By the time I got there, a police officer had arrived. Sarah had managed to calm the boy down enough that he could tell them his name, Tommy, and that he had been missing for three days. The officer looked grim as he radioed in the information. As we waited for more police to arrive, Tommy clung to Sarah, refusing to let go of her hand. He was still too scared to say much, but he kept looking around nervously, as if expecting the man in the hoodie to reappear at any moment. I felt a mix of anger and helplessness, knowing that we had been so close to catching whoever had taken him. More officers arrived and they began to set up a perimeter and question people in the area. The Halloween party continued around us, but there was a noticeable shift in the atmosphere. The carefree joy of earlier in the evening had been replaced by a tense undercurrent of concern and fear. We spent the next couple of hours giving our statements to the police, describing the man we had seen and the chase through the park. They praised us for our quick thinking and trying to catch him, but warned us about the dangers of confronting potential kidnappers. I couldn't help but feel a little guilty, realizing how reckless I had been in chasing after the man without knowing if he was armed or dangerous. As the night wore on, more details emerged. Tommy had been abducted from a playground in Queens three days earlier. His parents had been frantic, and the police had been searching non-stop. It turned out that the kidnapper had brought Tommy to the Halloween party, thinking he could blend in with the crowds and possibly make an escape with the child. Tommy's parents arrived at the park and the reunion was both heartbreaking and heartwarming. His mother burst into tears as soon as she saw him, scooping him up in her arms and holding him tight. His father thanked us over and over, his voice choked with emotion. Seeing them together, safe at last, brought tears to my eyes. The party wound down as news of what had happened spread. Many people stayed to help the police search the park, hoping to find some trace of the kidnapper. The carefree Halloween celebration had turned into a community coming together in the face of a frightening situation. As dawn broke over the city, Casting a pale light over Central Park, Sarah and I finally headed home. We were exhausted, both physically and emotionally. The adrenaline of the chase and the hours of talking to the police had left us drained. But underlying it all was a sense of relief that Tommy was safe and back with his family. In the days that followed, the story was all over the news. The police released a sketch of the kidnapper based on our descriptions and Tommy's account. They also praised the quick actions of the partygoers who had helped spot and chase the man. The community rallied around Tommy and his family. 
offering support and keeping an eye out for the suspect. A week later, there was a break in the case. A tip from someone who recognized the man from the sketch led to his arrest in a small town upstate. It turned out he had a history of similar crimes in other states. Knowing that he was off the streets brought a sense of closure to the whole ordeal. The next Halloween, I found myself volunteering at a safe trick-or-treating event for kids, making sure they had a fun and secure place to enjoy the holiday. It felt good to give back and help create positive memories for children and families in the wake of what had happened. It was the summer of 2018 and Detroit was buzzing with energy. The city had been going through a renaissance of sorts, with abandoned buildings being transformed into hip new spaces and the underground music scene thriving like never before. I'd been living in the city for a few years, working as a graphic designer and spending my weekends exploring the vibrant nightlife. One Friday afternoon, my friend Jake burst into our shared workspace, his eyes gleaming with excitement. He'd heard about an exclusive warehouse party happening that night, somewhere in the Eastern Market District. Jake was always in the know when it came to these underground events, and I'd learned to trust his judgment. He showed me a cryptic Instagram post with just a phone number and the words, text for location, tonight, 10 p.m. I was intrigued, but a little hesitant. These warehouse parties could be hit or miss, and there was always a slight risk involved. But Jake's enthusiasm was contagious and I found myself agreeing to go. We spent the rest of the afternoon speculating about what the night might hold our anticipation building with each passing hour. As the sun began to set, we started getting ready. I threw on my favorite vintage band tee, a pair of well-worn jeans, and my trusty Converse sneakers. Jake opted for a more eclectic look with a neon tank top and cargo pants covered in reflective patches. We gathered a small group of friends. There was Sarah, an artist I'd met at a gallery opening, Mike, a DJ who was always on the lookout for new sounds, and Lisa, a law student who loved to let loose on the weekends. At 9.45 p.m., we piled into Jake's beat-up Volkswagen van and headed towards Eastern Market. The streets were alive with people bar hopping and enjoying the warm summer night. As we drove, Jake texted the number from the Instagram post. A few minutes later, he received a response with an address and a simple instruction. Look for the red door. We parked a few blocks away from the location, the excitement palpable as we walked through the quiet streets. The area was a mix of old brick buildings, some renovated into trendy lofts, others still bearing the marks of decades of neglect. We turned a corner and saw a small group of people gathered near a nondescript building. As we got closer, we spotted the red door. It was barely visible in the dim light, but there it was, our gateway to the night's adventure. A burly guy standing by the door asked for the password. Jake leaned in and whispered something I couldn't hear. The man nodded and stepped aside, allowing us to enter. We walked down a narrow hallway, the muffled thump of bass growing louder with each step. At the end of the hall, Another door opened up into a cavernous space that took my breath away. The warehouse was massive with high ceilings and exposed brick walls. Colorful lasers cut through the air, creating mesmerizing patterns on the walls and floor. A DJ booth was set up on a raised platform at the far end, surrounded by towering speakers. The crowd was a diverse mix of people, Hipsters, ravers, artists, and curious newcomers like us. We made our way to the makeshift bar, grabbing some drinks and taking in the scene. The music was an eclectic mix of techno, house, and experimental electronic sounds that seemed to pulse through my entire body. Jake was in his element, already chatting up a group of people near the DJ booth. Sarah and Lisa headed to the dance floor while Mike hung back with me analyzing the DJ's technique and equipment setup. As the night progressed, 
the warehouse filled up and the energy intensified. I found myself lost in the music, dancing with abandon alongside strangers who quickly became temporary friends. The heat from the packed bodies made the air thick and humid, but nobody seemed to mind. Every now and then I'd catch glimpses of my friends in the crowd. Jake was now up in the DJ booth, chatting animatedly with the performer. Sarah was creating an impromptu art piece on one of the walls with some markers she'd brought. Lisa was in the middle of a dance circle, showing off moves I didn't know she had. It must have been around midnight when I first noticed something off. I was taking a breather near one of the walls when a strange smell caught my attention. At first I thought it might be some kind of special effect. Maybe a fog machine or some artsy installation. But as I focused on it, I realized it smelled like burning plastic. I looked around, trying to spot the source. But in the chaos of the party, it was hard to pinpoint anything. I made my way back to our group, shouting over the music to ask if anyone else smelled it. Mike nodded, a concerned look crossing his face. We decided to investigate, moving around the perimeter of the warehouse. As we got closer to the back of the building, the smell grew stronger. Mike pointed to a small door tucked away in a corner. Wisps of smoke were seeping out from underneath it. My heart started racing as the realization hit. This wasn't part of the show. Something was seriously wrong. I grabbed Mike's arm and yelled that we needed to find the others and alert security. As we turned to move back into the crowd, a shrill sound cut through the music, the fire alarm. For a moment, everything seemed to freeze. The music cut out abruptly, and in the sudden silence, the blaring of the alarm seemed deafening. Then, as if a spell had been broken, chaos erupted. People started pushing towards the exit, the once joyful crowd, now a panicked mass of bodies, all trying to escape at once. I lost sight of Mike in the commotion. Frantically, I searched for my other friends, calling out their names. The smoke was getting thicker, making it hard to see and breathe. I pulled my shirt up over my nose and mouth, trying to filter the air as I pushed against the flow of people, desperate to find Jake, Sarah, and Lisa. The main exit was completely jammed with people shoving and yelling as they tried to squeeze through. I remembered the red door we'd come in through and started directing people towards it, hoping it would provide another way out. As I helped guide people, I kept scanning the crowd for my friends. Suddenly, I heard Sarah calling my name. I turned to see her helping a girl who had fallen. The girl's leg was twisted at an odd angle, and she was clearly in pain. Without hesitation, I made my way over to them. Together, Sarah and I managed to lift the injured girl, supporting her between us as we slowly made our way towards the exit. The heat was intense now, and I could see flames licking up one of the walls near the back of the warehouse. The sound of sirens in the distance was a small comfort, but I knew we needed to get out fast. We inched forward, the weight of the girl and the press of bodies making progress painfully slow. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached the red door. A security guard was there, holding it open and helping people out. He saw us struggling with the injured girl and immediately came to assist. With his help, we managed to get her outside and away from the building. The cool night air was a shock after the stifling heat of the warehouse. Firefighters were already on the scene, rushing into the building as the last of the party goers stumbled out. Paramedics swarmed around, checking on people and providing oxygen to those affected by the smoke. I looked around frantically, still trying to locate Jake and Lisa. Sarah stayed with the injured girl as she was tended to by paramedics. Just as I was about to go back towards the warehouse, I spotted Jake helping Lisa, who was coughing heavily. Relief washed over me as I ran to them, 
pulling them both into a tight hug. We regrouped on the sidewalk across from the warehouse, watching in stunned silence as firefighters battled the blaze. The building that had been pulsing with life just an hour ago was now engulfed in flames, thick black smoke billowing into the night sky. The gravity of what had just happened began to sink in. We had been incredibly lucky. As we gave our statements to the police, we learned more about what had transpired. The fire had started in a back room where old electrical equipment was stored. The building's outdated wiring, combined with the strain of powering the massive sound and light systems for the party, had caused a short circuit that quickly spiraled out of control. The next few hours were a blur of sirens, flashing lights, and questions from authorities. We learned that most people had made it out safely, but there were injuries, some serious. The girl Sarah and I had helped was being taken to the hospital for treatment. But the worst news came later. One person hadn't made it out. A guy who had been near the back when the fire started had been overcome by smoke before he could escape. As dawn broke over Detroit, casting a surreal light on the smoldering remains of the warehouse, we finally headed home. The drive was silent, each of us lost in our own thoughts about what we'd just experienced. The adrenaline had worn off, leaving us exhausted and shaken. In the days that followed, the incident was all over the local news. The organizers of the party were facing serious charges for hosting an event in an unsafe building without proper permits. The tragedy sparked a citywide crackdown on underground events and a renewed focus on building safety. For our group, the aftermath was deeply personal. Jake, who had always been the life of the party, became more subdued. He felt guilty for bringing us to the event, even though we assured him it wasn't his fault. Sarah threw herself into her art, creating a series of powerful pieces inspired by that night. Lisa, shaken by how close we'd come to disaster, decided to focus her law studies on building safety and event regulations. As for me, the experience left an indelible mark. I found myself constantly checking for exits whenever I entered a building, always aware of potential hazards. But it also gave me a new appreciation for life and the fragility of the moments we take for granted. We stayed in touch with some of the people we'd met that night, bonded by the shared experience. There were support groups and counseling sessions offered for those who had been at the party which helped in processing the trauma. It was the summer of 2019 and Miami Beach was alive with energy. I had just finished my junior year of college and was ready to blow off some steam with my best friends. We'd been planning this trip for months, a week of sun, sand, and nonstop parties in one of the hottest destinations in the country. Our group consisted of five of us, me, Lisa, Jake, Mia, and Carlos. We'd all met during freshman orientation and had been inseparable ever since. Lisa was the spontaneous one, always up for an adventure. Jake was our resident party animal, seemingly able to go all night without ever losing steam. Mia was the responsible one, always making sure we had a plan and stayed safe. Carlos was the laid-back surfer type, going with the flow and keeping us all grounded. We arrived in Miami on a Saturday afternoon, the hot, humid air hitting us like a wall as we stepped out of the airport. Our Airbnb was a small but stylish apartment just a block away from Ocean Drive. It was perfect, close enough to all the action but far enough that we could get some sleep if we wanted to. The first couple of days were a blur of beach time, shopping on Lincoln Road and nights out at some of the clubs on Washington Avenue. We danced until our feet hurt, laughed until our sides ached, and created memories I was sure would last a lifetime. 
Little did I know that our carefree vacation was about to take a dark turn. It was Tuesday night when we heard about the big beach party happening the next day. Word was spreading through social media about an all-day, all-night event that was supposed to be the highlight of the summer. Everyone was talking about it. In the cafes, on the beach, even the Uber drivers were buzzing with excitement. Wednesday morning came, and we headed to the beach early to secure a good spot. The party was centered around 12th Street, but it spread out for blocks in either direction. As we approached, we could already hear the music pumping from massive speakers set up on the sand. Colorful banners and flags fluttered in the breeze, and people were starting to stream onto the beach in their swimsuits and party gear. We found a spot not too far from one of the main stages and set up our beach blankets and umbrellas. The vibe was electric. DJs were spinning a mix of EDM, hip-hop, and Latin music that had everyone moving. Volleyball games sprung up spontaneously, and further down the beach I could see people parasailing and jet skiing. As the day wore on, more and more people arrived. The beach became a sea of bodies, all dancing, drinking, and soaking up the sun. Vendors walked up and down, selling everything from coconut water to glow sticks for the night ahead. The smell of sunscreen mixed with the salty sea air and the occasional whiff of marijuana. Lisa was in her element, dragging us from one activity to another. We joined a dance contest and lost spectacularly, tried our hand at a beach obstacle course, and even convinced Jake to get a temporary henna tattoo from one of the artists set up near the boardwalk. As the sun began to set, the party kicked into high gear. The beachfront hotels and bars opened their doors their music mixing with that from the beach stages. Neon lights and lasers cut through the growing darkness, turning the beach into a surreal, pulsating wonderland. We decided to grab some dinner before diving into the night's festivities. We found a spot at a crowded beachfront restaurant ordering a round of mojitos and some Cuban sandwiches. As we ate, we people watched and planned our night. Jake was keen on checking out a foam party happening at one of the clubs, while Mia wanted to stay on the beach where a famous DJ was scheduled to play at midnight. After dinner, we made our way back to the heart of the party. The crowd had grown even larger if that was possible. People were shoulder to shoulder, dancing and swaying to the music. The energy was intoxicating. We found a spot near one of the smaller stages and let ourselves get lost in the music and the moment. I'm not sure how much time had passed when Lisa said she was going to get more drinks. The pop-up bars were scattered throughout the beach, and the closest one had a long line. She said she'd try to find one with a shorter wait. We were all having such a good time that we just nodded and kept dancing. It must have been about 30 minutes later when I realized Lisa hadn't returned. I shouted to the others over the music, asking if anyone had seen her. They all shook their heads. Jake suggested she might have run into some other friends or gotten distracted by another part of the party. It seemed plausible. The beach was huge, and there was so much going on. But as another 30 minutes passed, then an hour, a knot of worry began to form in my stomach. This wasn't like Lisa. Even if she had gotten sidetracked, she would have let us know. I tried calling her cell phone, but the call went straight to voicemail. The noise and the crowds made it hard to think straight, but I knew something wasn't right. We decided to split up and look for her. Mia and I headed towards the bars, thinking maybe Lisa had gotten stuck in a long line. Jake and Carlos went towards the main stage, in case she had wandered that way. We agreed to meet back at our original spot in 30 minutes. As Mia and I pushed our way through the crowd, I couldn't help but notice how the atmosphere of the party had changed for me. What had seemed exciting and fun just hours ago now felt overwhelming and sinister. 
Every laughing group of friends made me wonder if Lisa was among them. Every time I glimpsed someone with long dark hair like hers, my heart would leap, only to sink again when I realized it wasn't her. We checked every bar we could find, describing Lisa to the bartenders and anyone who would listen. A few people thought they might have seen her, but in the chaos of the party, no one could be sure. As our agreed upon 30 minutes came to an end, we headed back to our meeting spot, hoping the guys had had better luck. But Jake and Carlos returned empty-handed as well. They had scoured the main stage area and even checked with the first aid tent, but there was no sign of Lisa. The knot in my stomach tightened. I suggested we call the police, but Jake thought we might be overreacting. He pointed out that it had only been a couple of hours, and Lisa was an adult who could take care of herself. We decided to give it another hour. We stayed together this time, methodically working our way through the crowd, calling Lisa's name and showing her picture to anyone who would look. But as the night wore on and the party showed no signs of slowing down, our search became increasingly desperate. Around 3 a.m., we finally went to one of the police officers patrolling the beach. The officer listened to our story but didn't seem particularly concerned. He explained that they got a lot of reports of missing people during these big events, and most of the time they turned up on their own, having just lost track of time or their friends. He took down Lisa's description and our contact information, promising to keep an eye out. As dawn broke over the ocean, casting a pale light over the remnants of the party, we were exhausted, scared, and no closer to finding Lisa. The crowds had thinned, leaving behind a mess of plastic cups, discarded flyers, and lost belongings. We made one last sweep of the beach before heading back to our Airbnb, hoping against hope that Lisa would be there, maybe having gone back on her own for some reason but the apartment was empty. We tried calling her phone again, but it was still going straight to voicemail. None of our other friends had heard from her either. With heavy hearts, we decided it was time to file an official missing person report. The next few days were a blur of police interviews, searching and waiting. We postponed our flights home, unable to bear the thought of leaving without Lisa. We plastered the area with missing person flyers, talked to local news stations, and scoured social media for any clues. The police seemed to take the case more seriously once they realized Lisa had been missing for over 24 hours. They interviewed people who had been at the party, checked security camera footage from nearby businesses, and traced Lisa's last known movements. Three days after the party, we got our first break. A homeless man who frequented the beach found Lisa's purse in a trash can near 5th Street, several blocks from where the party had been. Her phone and wallet were missing, but her ID was still there. The discovery sent chills down my spine. It was clear now that something bad had happened to Lisa. This wasn't just a case of her wandering off or losing track of time. The police stepped up their investigation bringing in more resources and treating the case as a possible abduction. They combed the area where the purse was found, interviewed more witnesses, and dug deeper into Lisa's background to see if there was anything that might explain her disappearance. Days turned into a week, and still, there was no sign of Lisa. Our families flew down to join the search, and a volunteer group was organized to canvas the area. The local community rallied around us, with many Miami Beach residents joining the search efforts and offering support. It was on the ninth day that we finally got the news we had been desperately hoping for. Lisa had been found. A security guard at a closed beach club about a mile north of where the party had been held noticed something odd in one of the storage sheds on the property. When he investigated, he found Lisa disoriented and in need of medical attention, but alive. 
The relief we felt was indescribable. We rushed to the hospital where she had been taken, desperate to see her and make sure she was okay. But when we arrived, we were met by police officers and doctors who gently explained that while Lisa was physically recovering, she had been through a traumatic experience and needed time and space to heal. Over the next few days, the full story emerged. Lisa had been drugged at the party by someone she met there. This person had taken her to the beach club, which was closed for renovations, and held her captive in the storage shed. Lisa's memories of the ordeal were hazy due to the drugs, but it was clear she had been through a horrifying experience. The police launched a manhunt for Lisa's abductor, using her description and forensic evidence from the scene. The entire Miami Beach community was on high alert, determined to bring the perpetrator to justice. As Lisa began her recovery, we struggled with our own feelings of guilt and helplessness. We couldn't help but think of all the what-ifs. What if we had gone with her to get drinks? What if we had started searching sooner? What if we had been more careful? The carefree joy of our vacation seemed like a distant memory, replaced by a harsh reality we were all struggling to process. The incident shed light on the darker side of Miami's party scene. Local authorities began implementing stricter security measures for large beach events, and there was a push for better education about party safety and the dangers of drink spiking. The carefree days of our youth seemed to be behind us now. We had been forced to confront the harsh realities of the world in a way we never expected. But we also discovered the strength of our friendship, the kindness of strangers, and the resilience of the human spirit. As we finally prepared to leave Miami Beach, our hearts heavy with all that had transpired, we made a pact. We would never take our safety or our friendships for granted again. We would look out for each other and for others around us. And we would carry the lessons learned from this experience with us always. A reminder of how precious and fragile life can be. Thank you for watching. If you found these stories gripping, don't forget to subscribe for more spine-tingling content. For another hair-raising tale, check out our suggested video. And if you're hungry for more eerie encounters, dive into our playlist featuring similar chilling narratives.